verse 21. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. So the first spiritual message I want to tell you is that when you feel sadness or bitterness, put it in prayer. Do not spread it to people around you. No one will tolerate it easily, and they may be miserable comforters. You may expect great sympathy, and when you do not, do not receive it, you may feel even more bitterness. Like the verse says in Psalm 69, 20, I, look for someone, I looked for someone to take pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. There is no one who can comfort you like prayer. Recall this to your mind means if you feel bad, go pray. You feel bad again, go pray again. Still feeling bad, pray again. There is no other solution. After the first 20 verses that were full of bitterness, he said, This I recall to my mind. This is what I have been thinking of for days. So the only solution is to have hope in God. So the first important message is when you are tired, stressed, sad, or in pain, <clears throat> physically or emotionally, put your hopes in God. There is nothing else. Recall all these emotions in prayer, not outside prayer. When someone complains a lot when he prays, hope will be born inside his heart. The Holy Fathers say that prayer has a mystery. If someone recalled his misery over and over, it is supposed to be turned into depression and despair. Outside of prayer, you will feel depressed if you do so. <clears throat> but if you do it in prayer, you will have hope. Let's say it again because it's important. If you feel self-pity and you start to overthink and talk a lot outside of prayer, you will feel despair, despair and depression. If you take all your concerns and put it in front of God all the time, hope will be created inside you, unlike talking to people. This is the mystery of prayer. As long as you are in God's presence, you feel the bitterness alleviated and you see the beam of hope. It will, it will get better. I will see light. This is from prayer, not from outside. Jeremiah, as a man of prayer, understands this. So he said, I recall this to, in my mind, therefore I have hope. <clears throat> as long as I want to complain, I will go pray to God and tell him. You are my hope. No one will comfort me but you. No one will raise me from this death but you. So hope is the son of prayer and pain. Hope is created inside prayer and created from pain. We are in the midst of a hope crisis. Everyone is shocked and we feel lost. Hope is born from hardship and prayer. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of hope. He reminds you of God's promises which say, What's up? Am I asleep? Everything is okay. Everything will be better than what anyone may expect. Hope is born in prayer and hope is also the brother of humility. What does that mean? The first person to feel despair is the person who is proud. The arrogant is the first to get depressed. The humble is the least one of all to feel despair or depression. The Holy Fathers have a metaphor about that. They said that when a crawling baby falls down, it is just two inches from the ground. Nothing will happen. He won't even cry. But when someone falls from above the stairs, he can break his neck. That is a bad injury. So if someone is humble near the ground, what will happen to him? Whatever happens, he will not be seriously injured. But the one with high pride, his fall will be bad. So hope is the brother of humility. Means that when you are humble and know that you are weak, you can easily think that God will solve the problem. You say, I am always weak. I can do nothing. God does everything. He did yesterday and today and will tomorrow. Hope is near the heart of the humble. The next verse, verse 22. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. The prayer in spirit must mention God's mercies even in the middle of the hardships. When someone is very sad, usually his prayer is full of complaints. You will be surprised when you see that in many of the saints' prayers, in the middle of the complaint, in the middle of the lamentations, they think about God's mercies. How come? You and your people are miserable. Can't you see that? This is the action of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit teaches us how to pray and to remember God's mercies, even in the hard times. This is not logical. Logically speaking, the problem will take your mind away, but this is beyond logic. Your heart tells you, 
I will not forget how God in times past has listened to me and given to me. It is a blessing that I am still alive and still breathing. I did not perish, and I am not in hell, and this is a gift from God. If there is no hope for me, I would have died and gone to hell. As long as I am alive, there is hope. He does not want me to perish in hell. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. <clears throat> because he has, because his compassions fail not. This is hope. Hope makes you think positively that there are mercies, and the evidence is that you are not consumed yet. There is hardship, problems, heartaches, but still you did not perish. So there is hope. Obviously, your destiny is heaven, not hell. Or it can mean, it is enough that we are not consumed. Whatever happens, it is enough that I am not consumed. This also includes being thankful during hardships. His compassions fail not. Are you contemplating God's mercies in front of the destruction of your city and the burning of the temple? Are you contemplating God's mercies when you are in agony, Jeremiah? Yes. This is the action of the Holy Spirit. He makes you thankful even in the middle of hardships. I met people in very difficult situations, and their, their, their first immediate reaction was, thanks be to God. This cannot be logical. Whether we're talking about a difficult accident or people dying, it just isn't logical to think about thanking God at this moment. But this is not logic. This is the action of the Holy Spirit. These are the people who pray. Gratitude is born in their hearts, even in hardships. This reminds us of the saying in the Psalms, which says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. These are favorite expressions among all the Holy Fathers. His compassion fails not, or his mercy endures forever. Why? There is always a known comparison between our never-ending sins and God's mercy. And God's mercy always wins. In the midnight praise, we say, My sins are more than the sand of the sea, more than the rain. Did any one of you count the droplets of the rain? They are countless. Your sins are countless. But when they are put in front of God's mercy, God's mercy wins. His compassions fail not. How many are your sins? Millions? Billions? These days, a billion is easy. Billions are easy. Still, his mercies never fail, and they endure forever. In prayer, the Holy Spirit leads some internal dialogue. That is, a dialogue between the sin's voice that tells you your sins are too many, and God's voice which tells you, I love you very much. Who wins? This struggle happens during prayer. So when you are sad, exhausted, angry, and ashamed of yourself, there is another voice telling you that it is okay. All sins will be deleted. Micah seven nineteen, He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. He will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. This is a beautiful verse with the same concept. God will again have compassion on us. He will forgive you again. He will subdue our iniquities. He will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Anything thrown into the sea will dissolve and disappear. Verse 23. His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Jeremiah nearly forgot about all his misery when he mentioned mercy. In the first 20 verses, he was crying and weeping and talking about bitterness and wormwood. Then he said, This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. As soon as Jeremiah mentioned the word hope, his mood changed to, His compassions fail not, and through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed. Then to, They are new every morning, great is your faithfulness. This has a beautiful meaning. Every morning before you wake up, God summons the angel who carries your life. Every angel has someone's file. When God opens your file and sees it all black, he turns the page and opens a new blank page. What about yesterday? Yesterday is history now. There is new mercy for you every morning as if <clears throat> you have no sin, ever. God treats you every day as if you never sinned. Oh Lord, yesterday I sinned a lot. I did not know how you can still stand me. That's why the prophet says 
in Psalms 30, in Psalm 30, verse 5, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. It's as if you are a new person. Isn't that he who was crying yesterday asking for forgiveness? It's over. In the morning there is a new white page. This is God's mercies. Great is your faithfulness. <clears throat> he is that faithful. He never changes. The words, they are new every morning, tell us that every day is like a, a whole life. It is a loss if you missed it. And you should separate it from before. Do not expect it to be bad because all the past was bad. Make a brand new day. If you do not count the past, your profile will be clear and perfect. Do not count on the past. In Hebrews 3.13, Exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Every time a new day arrives, say, Thank you, God. This is a new life, a new white page, and I can write whatever I want on it. Let us forget about before as if I am a new person. Let us pray and do, not, and do good and walk uprightly. Psalm 35 This anger is but for a moment. His anger is but for a moment. His favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Great is your faithfulness means God is very faithful to his children. No prayer is dismissed by him. No cup of water is forgotten. There is good news for the brokenhearted in prayer. He forgets all the sins and opens a new balance sheet for good deeds, even if they were insignificant. This is because of his faithfulness. Do you know how someone can be faithful to the extent of paying one cent out of his honesty? God counts even what you do not count. You may be, do minor good deeds that are not significant in front of your sins. Your sins are deleted, so your small good deeds are counted. In 2 Timothy 2, verse 12 and 13, If you endure, we shall also reign with him. If we are faithful, faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself, so he will remain faithful. Verse 24, the Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I hope in him. Notice that I am focusing on the happy part in the chapter. When you attend the Good Friday service, the first 20 verses are very bitter, but our church is great because it shifts the mood at the 12th hour from the heartaches and pain of the crucifixion to the joy of salvation. In the middle of Friday night, it shifts the mood to bright Saturday when half of the hymns are in sad tunes and the other half are in happy tunes. This begins with the lamentations because half of them are bitterness and the other half are hope. We began the joyful part. The, the Lord is my portion, says my soul, meaning every time you truly pray, you reach this conclusion. In prayer, you say, there is none upon earth that I desire besides you as in Psalm seventy three twenty five, You are my portion. I do not want money, people, pride, success. These are all nothing. When you pray from the heart, you reach this meaning on your own. If you pray in spirit, even if you are a sinner, sad, distressed, or happy, <clears throat> you reach this meaning. I want nothing but you. You are enough. What do you want? I want nothing. Just want. I just want you. This is why prayer is the gate of sanctification. Those who had been sanctified knew their prayer, knew true prayer, and could say, you are my portion. <clears throat> in Psalm 16, the prophet said, the lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. Back then, they used to divide the lands by robes. So the prophet was saying that the, his division has fallen on a good land. But it didn't matter because you have pers preserved my inheritance. If they gave me a good land or a bad one, or even if they gave me nothing, it doesn't matter. My inheritance is preserved. The inheritance is God. My portion is God. They can't take him away from me. If they were unfair to you or stole from you, that's okay. Even if they take your life, they cannot take God from you. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I have hope in him. When God divided the land between the 12 tribes of Israel, he divided it into 11 parts only. Why? He told them that Levi has no portion in the land. Levi is mine. Their slogan was, their slogan will be, 
The Lord is my portion. The priests were from the tribe of Levi. That's why in the New Testament, he made us kings and priests to him. Revelation 1, 6 and 5, 10. We became like Levi. We all have no portion on earth anymore. Our portion is the Lord. But the tribe of Levi, who said my portion is the Lord and had no part in the land, got its part from the tithes <clears throat> paid by the other 11 tribes. So they got 11 tenths which is one-tenth more than the other tribes. So they said, the Lord is my portion. And they did not work in the farms, yet they got 11 tenths. But they also paid tithes from these tithes. Therefore, the concept of the Lord is my portion means that whoever seeks God will be sought by the world. And whoever seeks the world loses everything. Whoever seeks God and says that he is everything to him, you'll find that everything seeks him without any effort. Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. If you focus on the world and want more of it, the world will vanish and God will too. Prayer frees us from the worldly portion, meaning if you are still attached to the worldly things, Prayer will cut those attachments without you even noticing. The gold that you love, the position that you are ha happy about, etc. All these things get cut out from your heart when you truly pray. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. Verse 25. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. Just a translator's note here. The Arabic translation says something to the order of those who hope in him. This is the third mention of hope. It's all about hope here. Whoever prays in spirit forgets about what he, ha he was praying for and starts to say, You are so good, Lord. Jeremiah started with crying and complaining about the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, and he wanted to ask why this happened. He forgot about all these things and said, you are so good, Lord. When the Holy Spirit leads a person, he makes him contemplate God. You began with the sadness and the troubles that you want to talk about, but that has now ended. There is a better and bigger topic to talk about. You stand in front of God saying to him, You are so good. What is all this kindness? You give to whoever asks you. Contemplating God's attributes is a main sign of prayer in spirit. Having a good standing with God is a combination of love, humility, and hope. You love God, you have hope in Him, and you feel humble in front of Him. These three feelings make you have a good standing with God. At the same time, something happens during prayer without thinking about it. When you stand in front of God a lot, His image and attributes are carbon copied onto you. When you say, you are so good, Lord, you become good too. When you say, you are so generous, Lord, you leave with less selfishness. When you say, you are so merciful, your heart begins to have mercy on people. These internal changes happen during prayer. The attributes of God get copied onto you. Verse 26. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Still talking about waiting and about hope. Jeremiah mentioned all the, all the problems at the beginning and then said, You are my portion. I have no hope but you. Your mercies are every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Through your mercies we are not consumed. And then he said, Okay, I will wait for you. I will wait till you solve the problems. And here he said that there is nothing better than waiting for the Lord. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. You begin the prayer waiting for grace, an answer, or a change. Psalm twenty-seven, fourteen: Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Wait for him, he will answer, he will solve. After the prayer, there should be a time of silence, if not during the prayer. One of our biggest mistakes is that when we finish prayer, we act as if we've been deprived of talking. After the divine liturgy, we see people talking a lot. After praying at a, at a conference, we keep t telling people to keep quiet. He who truly prays does not talk much after the prayer because he was talking to God. Does he want to talk to humans? That is not important. Not now. Silence preserves the prayer. 
Let us practice being cautious of much speaking after a good prayer. Be cautious to not talk a lot. The huge hospitality of food after the Sunday Divine Liturgy is not exactly right. On Good Friday, after, after praying for almost 10 hours, people focus on eating. <clears throat> what is that which we are doing? We were focusing on the cross, salvation, and eternal life. We were in heaven, yet we find women thinking about food and making it, and the family gathers and gossips about the people whose names were not mentioned once all year long. This is, this is happening on Good Friday. What is that? We have, ma- we have many wrong traditions. Of course, it is good to eat together. I'm not against that tradition, but these traditions should have a spiritual nature. This is a spiritual ceremony. All churches are full and happy. We should be mindful of the blessing that we had. Also, on the eve of Easter, we have a long divine liturgy and the reenactment of the resurrection, and then we find a, run- a runway show happening at the church doors. What is that? Satan knows how to steal the blessing that we have in prayer. After prayer, wait for the answer. Sometimes someone prays, but it is as if he had not. So long as you prayed and told God about your problem, he listened. He received your request, he will solve it. If you told him, my hopes are in you, then, okay, son, your hope will not fail. But there are some people who pray and then question if God will answer. Didn't you ask and tell God what you wanted? All these things have been heard. Prayer without hope is meaningless. Hope is very important in prayer. To know that God hears you and that he will answer if your request is good. It is good that one should hope. Reminds me when Peter beheld the Lord's glory and said, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Those who pray and see Christ during prayer do not want to finish praying. As beginners, we get bored. After 15 minutes, we fidget and want to finish quickly. But if we continue, we will like it and will not want to end prayer. When we get closer to God, we won't like the fast to end. People get sad because the big fast that is Lent is coming soon. I'm exaggerating. I know that many people are happy about it. There are others who get sad when Lent is about to end. Is the fast over? They say wistfully. It's good that they feel that way. It means that they are spiritual and enjoy the fast and prayer. Other people hate February because it has Jonah's fast and then the big fast as if it is like some sort of punishment. There is a big difference between these two groups of people. Verse 27. It is good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. In prayer, man discovers his mission, discovers his cross. Because without bearing the cross, you cannot go to heaven. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Luke 9.23 Jeremiah, not knowing yet about the cross, said that it is good to bear the yoke of his youth. In prayer, you discover your mission or service, that is, your cross, or your temptation, or your fight. Meaning, the cross has three forms. The first one is your mission or service, which is your role in life. Do you serve people, bring them to God, and support them? The second cross is your temptation, your problem, your hardship, your yoke. The third cross is your fight against sins and your striving in prayer. There must be a yoke in your life. A yoke is a heavy piece of wood used on the shoulders of animals. Christ said, My yoke is easy, my burden is light. Matthew 11.30 He is very humble. He means that he bears our yoke with us as the main animal that pulls the cart. So we walk together. So he lifts the main weight and you are walking with him. My yoke is easy. Means that he is carrying the weight. You just walk with him. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew 11, 28. Jesus says, I will carry everything. Therefore the yoke is easy because the stronger one will carry most of the weight. Verse 28. Let him sit alone and keep silent, because God has laid it on him. After prayer, when you pray from the heart, I remind you, it begins with complaints, then contemplating God's mercies, and hope fills Jeremiah's heart. Then he begins to utter uh, spiritual messages. He said, I will sit and wait on the Lord. Whoever likes prayer likes silence, and vice versa. Talking too much is the enemy of prayer. At the beginning of the fast, the Holy Fathers say, Whoever doesn't control his tongue cannot control his stomach. 
Whoever doesn't fast by his tongue, his fast is in vain. If you want to truly fast, control them both. Control your talking and eating. Limit your food and your talk, so you can pray without limits and have the right mood. Let him sit alone and keep silent. Jeremiah began to miss being alone. Those who like praying like solitude and vice versa. Our Lord Jesus was very concerned about having some quiet time, even if he was busy. In the mornings, he went to a far place and prayed. And another time, he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, Luke twenty-two forty-one. So he went far from them alone to pray. Verse 29, let him put his mouth in the dust, there may yet be hope. This is the fourth mention of hope. Hope happens when one puts his head to the ground, to the dust. From humility, hope is born. When you are humble and ashamed of your sins, your heart will be filled with hope. You feel relieved because God forgave you. Everything is now deleted. The saints prostrate to the ground a lot. Moses, Elijah, Paul, and Jeremiah. Many verses confirm that they liked prostrations. It is not our invention. They put their head to the ground when they were talking to God. Moses bowed to the ground at once, so God forgave his people when he prostrated. Verse 30. Let him give his cheek to the one who strikes him and be full of reproach. When you pray zealously and have some silent time, you are spiritually charged. You become strong and don't shake, whatever happens. For example, Christ prayed a powerful prayer in Gethsemane and then went to trials. He was slapped, beaten, humiliated, but he was silent and did not tremble. No martyr can tolerate pain without proper praying. No one can tolerate tribulation without praying well. Let him give his cheek to the one who strikes him and say, I am ready. Do whatever you want. I am, a, I am not afraid of pain. I am empowered by prayer. Be full of reproach means prayer did not cancel the reproach or the temptation, but it gave strength. He did not break down from the reproach or pain. Verse 31, For the Lord will not cast off forever. Again, we see the same hope. What Jeremiah saw was that God was angry with his people, Jerusalem was destroyed, the temple was burned, total destruction. But when he prayed, he uttered a prophecy, The Lord will not cast off forever. The view, that is, the outward landscape of the situation, indicates that God abandoned his people. However, with prayer, we see that he did not. Sin gives you the feeling of being rejected from God. When you pray, you feel that he does not reject you. He wants me and accepts me. Isaiah 54, 7, For the Lord will not cast off forever. For a mere moment I have forsaken you, but with great mercies I will gather you. When God leaves you, it is for but a brief moment. Like with the disciples, Jesus left them for seven hours, but for God it was a brief moment. And then he brought them back with compassion. With a little wrath I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness I will have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Isaiah 54, 8. If you feel that God has left you, be sure that this feeling is for a brief moment. If you feel that he rejected you, it is for a brief moment. This is not forever. He will bring you back and have mercy on you. He will not cast off forever. So when you finish your prayer, say, Lord, I know that I am not rejected. Your mercy and faithfulness are bigger than my sins, and you will forgive everything. And glory be to God forever. Amen.